And we're back with another episode of B Scar TV. And we have a very, very special guest today, my man, Alec Ingold, AKA Hitman. <laughs> well, he gotta be pumping tires <laughs> like that right off the bat. Uh, I always uh, introduce people by their the government name and then their nickname. Uh huh. Coach McDaniel has given you Hitman, but is there a nickname that you've gone by uh, in your past? No, Alec is such like a unique name. It's like some people try and do nicknames. I don't think they really ever stick. Dude. It's like yeah, I don't know. It's a Alec is you know a lot of people call me Alex on accident, but. Yeah. No, I never really had a nickname that really stuck like that. You so. do got a tough name to nickname off of. It's, it, it is what it is, man. It's four letters, two syllables. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know I how mean, much shorter you could get. Like, I don't you know. You can go AI. You could. And it's already been done before. Yeah, but it didn't stick, though. Like well, Alan I'm saying Iverson AI. Stuck. Yeah, I'm saying AI is Allen Iverson for sure. So it's already been done. It's, it's been done. So Your, uh, your Instagram is AI. It is. I did, and then I did the little Roman numerals for forty-five. That's been my number for like eight years now. So I had oh, to hit okay. up Duke and be like, "What's up, bro? Like, you really like number forty-five or what?" He's like, "Yeah, dog. I, I really like it." So, Jeez. so now we had to do a little rebrand. No, no number uh, thirty now. <laughs> okay, the three O. The three O looks good for it, you. Bro, I had man. to shed a little bit of weight, you know, make it <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> it's kind of a running back number, so yeah. Oh man, that but. zero puts on a little pack some pounds, you know. It's it, they're as, wide numbers now. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not as slimming as forty five. No, no, but it's all good, man. It's good to be here. Um, shoot, it's been a wild ride, and um, yeah, it's um, it's good though. Thirties different, yeah. whole vibes different, teams different. Um, comes with all all forms of challenges. I mean, obviously so. in. in um, it's just kind of like you're welcome to the league moment, right? Like it's the business side of it, it's the life side of it, picking yeah. up and moving. And um, man, you just you understand how fortunate, and, like grateful you get to be to go to work mm -hmm. every single day. Like it's yeah. never you never take it for granted anymore. That's real. That's real. How much money did you offer Duke Riley for number forty five? I didn't offer him any money. I'm no. a I'm a financial literacy guy. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm I'm keeping my money in my pocket, dog. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I was just it, I just didn't know if it was. Um, I know he had moved around a little bit, changed his numbers. I'm like, dog. Right, right, I, right. I've had it for a long a long time now. He's like, yeah, but you know, it's my number. Yeah, I said, okay, I, I respect it. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't push it any further than that. Yeah. No, that's uh, it's cool to, I mean, have you as a teammate now. I've seen you play over the past. A uh, few seasons when you're in Vegas, and for me, it's like being an outside linebacker. You I pretty much know every full, every fullback around the league because right. you, t you know it's like it's likely that we're gonna meet. I was wondering how you were gonna say that. The <laughs> it's like there's some point through a game where an outside linebacker and a fullback are gonna go head to head, mm -hmm. and so when you're watching film, you always just look like. How hard is this guy hitting? <laughs> like, how how is he taking me on yeah. when, we, when they run that outside lead and it's fullback on outside linebacker and whoever wins that battle but essentially like makes the play happen or not happen. Uh, and obviously you're one of the better fullbacks in the league. I'll say the bet the best fullback in the league. Um, you're originally from Green Bay, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, and now you're in Miami. Two totally different places. Uh, I mean, coming from Green Bay, like such a football town, football yeah. city, what has your experience been like from being in Wisconsin, in Green Bay, um, Oakland, Vegas, here? Like, Yeah, I grew up in Green Bay, and that is, like you said, it's, it's football. You know, Sundays, you go to church, you can wear a polo or you can wear a Packer jersey. Like, that's, that's how it is. Yes. And uh, people love it there. I love it there. That's I grew up loving football, idolizing Packers, seeing them at the grocery store, at the Piggly Wiggly Festival, whatever it is, <laughs> and uh, just looking up to them like they're bigger than life. And you've seen them in schools, whatever impact that they had, um, you understood at a very young age how much power or influence somebody can have over a younger generation, just yeah. by the way you act, by the nonverbals. Like, I don't remember a single conversation I ever had with a Packer player, but I remember how they made me feel. I remember how a smile would just change my life, right? And like change my day. And um, that's something that I've always carried with me. And mm. not to say, um, 
that that happens everywhere, but I remember being that kid and just idolizing those people. So um, you carry that responsibility with you everywhere. Yeah. And I think it's something cool. It's a, it's a really, it's a good piece of perspective, um, not taking anything for granted. And then, yeah, dog, I, I mean, went to Wisconsin, dream school, very late offer, um, but made it happen. And then um, made my way out to Oakland as undrafted cat. That was crazy. Um, one year in the Bay, the last year the Raiders ever played in Oakland in the Coliseum. Wow. Um, like the, that whole stigma, the aura of the silver and black. One last year there, move over to Vegas, COVID hits. Literally, I packed up a car, my apartment, my fiance and I driving down from the Bay Area to Las Vegas. We throw our stuff. I close in on a little townhouse, throw our stuff there, fly out fly back about two months later just to put everything away get some yeah. furniture and the flights got canceled like covid hit oh wow we're officially moved in in las vegas um so that first year in in vegas covid year was crazy then you get one year with the fans uh, my third year there in the league and then now we're out in miami and it's how do you even describe miami Dude, like south florida it's like it's like the tropics it's like a movie yeah. And, you know, every time I move to a different spot, I try and find the quietest possible, get away from the lights, get away mm. from everything. I, cause I'm a very routine guy, very yeah. like, I need my environment exactly how I need it. And there's definitely really cool pockets out here in South Florida that I don't think people really talk about when you say mm. Miami, right? Yeah. And I think that's really cool about this place. And Miami is a, it's a very interesting place because there's so many different cultures is different you know flavors of food and just vibes and and I imagine uh, you you're you're trying to you're trying to find a quiet place maybe because like I'm assuming Green Bay is a little on the quieter dog side, <laughs> right? the spectrum is, is all the way over here dog. Yeah. Hey, um, but yeah you're used to being bored you're used to not having to do a lot you're not you're yeah. used to just being with good people and like good neighbors and being a good person goes a long way. So like that, all of that kind of meshes with just a quiet lifestyle, going to the grocery store, like figuring out simple patterns. And yeah. so that's what, that's what we did out here. Just found a spot, good neighbors, good neighborhood. And um, yeah, so far so good. I, I, like you said, diverse is crazy. It's, yeah. it's crazy out here, melting pot really. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, trying to, trying to get outside the comfort zone a little bit. And the football experience is, is great too. The fan base here has been loyal to their Dolphins for a long time. Yeah. When I was in Houston, you know, the Texans had just become a franchise in 2002. Young so team. So, like, yeah, relatively young, right? 20-year-old team at this point. And mm -hmm. when I got there, it was 2016. When I got there as an undrafted free agent, it was so they were only 14 years old. And so, like, the Dolphins, you know, like they won the undefeated team was yeah. 72, right? We're in like the, it's 50 years. 50 years ago. We're talking generations of fans, <laughs> yeah. you know? And How is that different for you? Like um, with the younger fan base, a different franchise, like what was that vibe like for yeah. you? Yeah, it it's funny because I always felt like Houston had just this really strange dynamic. Like they always say that tex in Texas, football is a religion. Yes. And you can see that with the Dallas Cowboys, yeah. right? That's America's team. Yeah. If you're a Cowboys fan, you're a Cowboys fan forever. Right. And your parents are and your offspring will be as well. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. And so you would expect it to be the same in Houston. Yeah. But the Texans fans at like when we when it was hot and we mm -hmm. were doing it like they were the best fan base to have. But mm. then when when you when we were losing they would, they would go let us know. Hey. Like, I hadn't heard as many boos from, our, from like, a crowd as mm -hmm. I did when I was in NRG. And these are years that we were winning the AFC South yeah. Championship, right? And I just think there was this, like, there's this dynamic of the Oilers were in Houston before the Texans. Yeah. And the Oilers were, like, pulled from the city and pulled from the fans mm -hmm. and taken to Tennessee, Tennessee yep. right? Not because they were a losing franchise, but because they didn't get funding from the city. So mm -hmm. the dude was like, all right, forget it. I'm going to yep. move them over here. And they're going to be the uh, Tennessee Oilers. And Houston went without a team for a long period of time. And then the Texans 
came, yeah. right? And then it was like people who were still there and didn't really go along with the mm -hmm. Oilers. They're like, oh, these Texans are trying to replace like yeah. this hole that I now have in my heart for the Oilers. Right. Like, I guess I'll be a fan because I'm here. But like, as soon as something goes wrong, like, oh, no, nah, forget them. That's you know? crazy. Is it like passion though, too? Like, because that's, if you have that, like, you say it's a religion down there in, in, in Texas. It's like, so you have this whole like heartbreak situation, but then they get, they get so passionate. Yeah. So when y'all are winning, it's crazy. When oh, you're losing, bro. it's still that passion. And they're informed fans too. Like yeah. they know what's going they on. Know. They watch film. Like they, mm -hmm. they go to, you know, their coaches, their everything. Like I, yeah. I think that's wild to me. And, you know, honestly, like the Texan fan base, for me, being an undrafted guy and spending the first five years of my career, like the Texans fan base embraced me. Yeah. And not just, you know, who I was on the field, but also like my personality off the field. And like when we were doing our Beast Guard TV player reporter stuff that at first there was some pushback because I was the second player reporter. I was, it was KJAC TV okay. from Kareem Jackson, who okay. now plays in Denver. Yep. And then I was the guy, it was kind of like same Euler to Texas situation. <laughs> but I came on the show and they're situation. like, this dude is corny. He's, t he's terrible. <laughs> and then after a few like episodes, they're like, oh, it's not bad. Yeah. And then, you know, eventually like when I'd be out in Houston, people were like, oh, Beast Car TV. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> like, like not outside linebacker number 57. So like, Beast Car TV. It's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, sign this up, yeah. sign in Beast Guard TV. That's crazy. Um, yeah, so I mean, it was uh, it was a good experience. Like, really cool to have passionate fans, regardless of if we were, you know, winning or losing. Better when we were winning, but just for the people to be showing up and to care, yeah. you know, about their, you know, their guys. You know, that it's uh, it's refreshing and yeah. it's encouraging. And it gives you a platform to be you. Mm -hmm. Like that's. That's all you can ask for, I feel yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. And I think, too, like, you know, especially being a guy that if you're not <clears throat> if you're not scoring touchdowns, right, if you're not throwing touchdowns, right, um, a lot of times it can be difficult to engage an audience or, like, build a community, um, right? And, I mean, 100%. as a fullback, like, yeah. you probably have felt that a little bit, too. But for you, like, one, I'm curious uh, how – you became a fullback like mm. how did you make that decision <laughs> in in your life like you're a super athletic dude not to say fullbacks aren't but like historically not the most athletic on the field yeah yeah um and then you know just i guess what has your experience been like engaging with fans in this position i was told fullback would be a great career path for me for my college coach yeah. so i got that late offer at wisconsin i was a quarterback in high school like Glory days, put on the huddle highlight tape. Like I'm, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, sta I'm stamping that thing. Like that's, <laughs> hey, certified <laughs> Wisconsin high school football. You know, is uh, it's a huddle tape. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, it, but, say less. Uh, <laughs> say less. We'll, we'll I take a lot up. of pride in that huddle tape. <laughs> no, but it's it, it's funny just going into that pick, taking a big leap, right? Like you go mid major, offer to play quarterback. You want to take that big leap? Oh, you want to play big time? You want to go to Wisconsin? It's my only Big Ten offer. But that's the, that's the dream. Like, you have to kind of you have to answer that question as an eighteen year old kid. Like, do I want to go someplace where I think I can be a great quarterback, do that mid major thing in DeKalb, Illinois, or do you want to take this leap of faith? Probably not see the field for four or five years, but that one year that you do as a redshirt senior, possible linebacker, whatever it is, right? That's your op. Like, that's right. your time to go make it. That's your time to go make plays. Like, are you willing to sacrifice? four years of development to get to that point. Yeah. And just having that conversation with my parents, it was like, let's take that leap of faith. Let's see how great you can be. And I feel like that's, that's what got me in the door. Just like cracked it open. Yeah. I said, okay, I'm gonna show up. I'm gonna work my tail off. And I, I'm, gonna ha I'm not gonna have any expectations. But let me just work. Let me just show up. Let me stay late. Let me just work. And it went from showing up at linebacker, all of a sudden I started making plays to training camp, you know, I'm rolling with the ones all of a sudden. Wow. And then all of a sudden we started installing more than just base defense. <laughs> and I, I didn't even know how to play defense at the time. So I'm learning what a base alignment is. I'm trying to learn how to even be in the right stance, how to fill like technique, basic stuff I'd never done before. As Cause a quarterback. you just played quarterback. Just in, played quarterback. In high school. Wow. And so okay. I'm trying to like figure all of that out on top of, oh, there's blitzes. Oh, there's coverages. Oh, I have to just like, I had no, yeah. I had no comprehension of any of that. Mm -hmm. So 
we started adding in defenses. My mental side of things slid a little bit. Yeah. Um, end up red shirting, and all of our running backs get hurt. Coach is like week two of the season. Alec, you wanna you wanna head over to the other side of the ball? You just played running back. I know you're doing well in linebacker, but I think you could do all right at running back. I was like, sure, let's do it. I have to study this playbook, and I literally went from a scout team linebacker week one of the season to week two I was suited up as an emergency running back. Oh, wow. And week three I burned my red shirt to play against Hawaii in a yeah. non-conference game, like just like that. And it wasn't expected. You know, I scored a bunch of short yardage touchdowns, Dare Ogumbawale and oh, Taiwan Dare. Deal. All those boys got the ball all the way down the field. <laughs> yeah. We got about the three-yard line. They'd, they'd run out big number 45. <laughs> I'd get the tug and go celebrate. But no, it's uh, all those boys, Corey Clement too. Um, a lot of guys were battling injuries, so that was my op. And mm -hmm. just learning the offense, throwing myself in it. All those boys get healthy next year, and they're like, well, you can either be like six-string running back or you know, you could put on some pounds and play fullback. And uh, that was kind of that decision. So right. late in the year, uh, Derek Watt was the starting fullback at that time. Okay. So I tried to like friggin' just be a sponge next to that guy. One of the best to ever do it. Yeah. Still playing in the league, still making plays, special teams, everything. Like I look up to that dude. Like, like it's unbelievable the way that he you know plays the game. So uh, I tried to learn as much as I could in that one year or that little end of that year. Yeah. And then it was then it was a wrap. And I was a fullback. Wow. And it was really just a love of the game. It was really just putting your pride aside, wanting to see how great you could be, being a team guy, and just like you just want to play football, man. Like. Mm -hmm. I'm not very big, I'm not very fast, I'm not tall or anything like that, but I love playing football, so fullback's kind of that spot where yeah. I can make an impact, I can do different things, I can catch the ball, run the ball, um, block uh, as much as I need to, so right. it was just the, the little crack in the door. I said, yeah. okay, let's do it, that's my out. Damn, it's crazy, the natural progression, too, like it was <clears throat> never almost really a decision that you made, it was just kind of like you know, go from linebacker, learn the linebacker yeah. position, which that was a conscious decision, like, yo, I want to do this. But then from there, it's kind of just like rolling with the punches. and It's really a mindset. Where, yeah. It was a mindset of, like, putting your pride to the side. I think I already said that, but just accepting that you have to trust people around you. Like, you can't, you can't make to league by yourself. Mm. And if you think that you can write out a whole big map and you're just gonna you know follow your whole way there and you're gonna plan this it's, that's not how it works there's yeah. gonna be injuries there's gonna be moves there's gonna be decisions that are out of your control the one thing you can control is your mindset and that decision to be like i'm a team guy yeah i'm gonna put other people's needs in front of my own i'm going to do everything i can to be the best football player i can be right. and then the spot's gonna be there for you and, the, and people are gonna feel that over a, a period of time it might take a little bit and yeah. it might take some reps it might take some different leads because you know it, we run ISO we run power we run any scheme that you want you might only feel that against a linebacker once or twice in the game right like you're saying but for me that's every single rep so you know we might be hitting each other on one play I got to bring it every single time knowing right. that that's that's for my you're at the point of attack for my running back to to get six inches to yeah. get a, a blade of grass mm. that's what you're fighting for mm. and that that's your fight of the game Two plays later, I got to go do that against E-Rob. Right. Two plays after that, I go against J.H. or B. Jones and like right. all these guys on the defense. It's like, that's my one op. That's my one op to gain respect over and over and over again. So you're, you're really fighting for blades of grass. And yeah. I mean, that's just, it's a mindset. So yeah, yeah it, wasn't a, it wasn't a split decision. It was definitely a flow to it, but um, definitely don't regret it. Yeah. No, that's, that's cool, man. That's uh it's interesting how this, this game of football, you know, as you're saying, like <clears throat> with the right mindset, you know, the right position will find you, mm. you know, through your whole kind of career, right? Like you start your career as one thing. Like I remember back in the day, I was playing running back. Like seventh what? grade. Hey, listen, everyone's <laughs> playing. <laughs> seventh grade, I was toting that rock. <laughs> Lost a lot of weight, so I was underneath the weight limit. Yep, yep. <laughs> I just hit my growth spurt, so I was I was slender back then. <laughs> Bro, I was, I was. Hey, when you're growing up, you, 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 I swear it's like you grow like this, and then all of a sudden you're like this, yeah, and then you're yeah. back like this. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. crazy. I had like six months where I was like this and I was a little slender and then I started putting putting some pounds on. <laughs> and, you know, I went like it was running back, it was tight end, it was defensive end, middle linebacker. Yeah. And then eventually like that outside linebacker spot found me when I was at Cal. But it's funny though, like when I transferred to uh, Stanford, <clears throat> it was a similar situation as you in that they had two outside linebackers, two stand-up guys there, Peter Columbia and Kevin Anderson, two dudes that could really play some ball. And But we were light on the defensive line. So we were playing the 3-4, like it was 4-I, 0-4-I. Yep. I had never played in there. That's a big jump to make. Yeah. <laughs> From that and outside linebacker like, to that 4-I. Well, like this is your, basically your position. Yeah. It's like, all right, you yeah. know, let's do it. And... Crazy enough, like going through that season and striking tackles, playing guards, like rushing out of a three technique, a one, a one tech, then making the transition to the league, like now having to strike tight ends. Like I was in a way better place Different. than most other edges coming into the league mm-hmm. as far as like having to set an edge. Like, yeah. oh, I got to set an edge on tight end. Like yeah. this is it's smooth, but it's crazy that, you know, almost divine intervention how – you know, I I play this position as my fifth year in school at Stanford, and it doesn't really fit my body type. But at the end of the day, it really worked out. Yeah, and it was all what, how you saw it. You saw it as an op. You mm-hmm. saw it as a, a growth. You saw it as an opportunity to get better or to play or wh- wherever you saw it. You know, other people could see it as, man, coach doesn't believe in me. Mm-hmm. Oh, coach, someone else, oh, he, yeah. he pulled favors or it's politics. And you point those fingers, it's like, that's a dangerous game to be playing because then yeah. you're not you're not le- allowing those those situations, the circumstance, the the adversity to really mold you to yeah. to grow you, and then to then transfer all those lessons you learn in what could seem as a valley is like then when you're on your mountaintop, it's like mm. all them lessons like you had to learn that the hard way. You had to you had to grow through it. You had to struggle because. You're saying you're saying it like you made that decision. That was I'm sure it was stressful. I'm sure you were oh, anxious sure. about it. I'm sure there was um, intrusive thoughts, all of that. And it's like to be able to fight that. Like that's that's what's elite. That's what makes NFL players, undrafted cats, people make it in the league. Yeah. And to be able to see all of those situations, coaches like man, coaches aren't. I, I should take this back. I don't want to. I don't want to speak on anybody or anyone's situations. But like. Nine times out of ten, a coach sees something in you. It's like they aren't out to get you, dog. Like yeah. it, it's not an attack on you. It's not personal. It's like they probably see something in you that you could grow from. And yeah. there's a circumstance. There's a situation. There is an op for you. Go take it. And um, obviously, it, it looks like it's different shapes and chi- sizes across the league, yeah. across the the defense, the offense, wherever you want to put it. But um, those gifts, they're, they're, they're places. You yeah. just got to look in the right spot. And you got to look at it the right way. Yeah. And I think it's hard, though. Like, you know, once you kind of get through <clears throat> a time of, of adversity, you know, and then you're kind of, then you're cruising or you're at that mountaintop to look back and be like, okay, now I understand why those things happened, right? Yeah. But when you're going through it, uh, like when you're going through that valley, to like keep your mindset to be like, <clears throat> nobody ever grows from, times of comfort it's only times of discomfort Mm. that people grow but to like set that in your mind I feel like it's so difficult it's so hard and there's a few different quotes I want to I want to hit on that one of the things that I learned was that being uncomfortable is is non-negotiable like you're going to be uncomfortable Mm. and the only choice you really have is where you're going to feel that discomfort where you're going to feel that uncomfortable spot Mm -hmm. is it going to be in practice is it going to be in the safety of your own home? Is it going to be out on the bright lights? Is it going to be, right. and like, you have to push yourself through those uncomfortable spots where I got to move to this four eye and man, I really have to go all in on this. Like you're at Stanford, you're, it's your spot, but man, I don't really feel like we're like, man, coaches talking about whatever. I got to move in here. This really isn't my spot. This isn't why yeah. I transferred here. You move into that four eye spot and it's like, man, I don't really want to be hitting these tackles. I don't want to have to rush as a three tech. And it's like those Pac-12 games, like the lights are on. Like, are you going to feel uncomfort when a big dude from USC is coming down on a down block and you ain't, you ain't pushed yourself. You haven't, right. you haven't right. felt that uncomfort in practice. You haven't been mm-hmm. able to 
prove to yourself, to your teammates, to your coaches, to your family that this matters to you. Yeah. And I feel like that's that mindset. That's that being able to go through that uncomfortable spot and saying, I'm going to go through this now or yeah. ask for it now. Yeah. And be like, let me walk through this uncomfortable spot now, knowing that when my op comes, when the situation arises, when the circumstances lift themselves, that's when it's time to shine. Yeah. And that's, that's a standard, that's discipline. And then when you're talking about going through those valleys, when you're talking about going through situations where, man, you can't, you can't see straight, you can't think straight because, man, this is hard, it's been a grind, yeah. the world's against me, you want to point fingers, whatever it is. Like One of the phrases I think Iggy Johnson said it was, you can't have proper perspective, or, or if you're losing perspective, you just got to pull yourself out of the frame. Mm. Just pull yourself out of the picture. Yeah. Take the emotion out of it. Take whatever you need to, bits and pieces of this puzzle, take a little bit out. Rearrange it a little bit. Yeah. See how it shakes. Mm. Take yourself out of that situation, and then yeah. you'll be able to see a whole lot more clearly. It's, it's like being able to give advice to a younger version of yourself, mm -hmm. or to your little brother or sister, whoever that is, it's like, yeah. man, I might need to take this myself. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I might need to, I might need no, to take this advice myself. So, um, yeah, that was, that was one of them gems that I think Iggy Johnson said was like, you want proper perspective, just pull yourself out of the frame. Pull yourself out of the frame. That's deep, man. And that's, I think, relevant for all of us, right? Like, it's so much easier to give someone else advice. <laughs> so you know what I mean? Yeah. Than to give, you know, yourself advice for your own problems or whatever you're going through because we're so emotionally involved in mm. our own lives, you know, and, and many times like, you know, we end up putting the, the blinders on right with whatever <clears throat> you're going through. And I, you know, I imagine it's probably like this regardless of your occupation, but for football, man, like it's football is, I feel like the, you know, when you talk about putting your blinders on, like you experience, at least for me, I've experienced that a ton, like, you know, it's it's really difficult to pull yourself out of um, that frame if you don't have the mindset like going through a um, well, there's a, a tough time or um, even just trying to, you know, learn more about um, who you are and how you can get better in a mm -hmm. situation. Right. Or how you can, you know, continue to grow in your in your position, uh, because when you're at the stadium, like, you know, you're you're part of it all. Right. It's not yeah. just you know, being at a computer and like dealing with a problem that's, you know, you're at work, you were like, we're actually really uh, <clears throat> immersed in, yeah. uh, in football and what you're going through, whether it's like a rehab or an injury, like it's your every day. It's like how you're, you're training to how you're learning to how you're performing, yeah. competing. It's on film. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're fully immersed yeah. in, in the experience. And um, I think, I mean, that's a, that's that's a quote that I'm gonna take with me. Pull yourself out of out of the frame. That's facts. And the magnitude of your situation is different, right? Your priorities, your perspective, um, that it's all tied in. Your passions, your pursuits, it's all tied in. It's inter it's intertwined. So when you're talking about a desk job versus you know a nine to five versus a, a CEO, a C-suite job to uh, a performer to an entertainer to a football player to a creative to whatever that is like the magnitude of your situation, the magnitude, the stakes that you're playing with, I think that's where um, issues get a little bit, it, it gets harder to pull yourself out of that frame yeah, when you're right. like, there's so much riding on this, there's yeah. so much responsibility here, there's mm -hmm. so many people counting on me. But if you can't have these conversations with people in your life, they can't understand your priorities, they can't understand your mindset, they can't understand why you do what you do, why you have a standard, why waking up at 5 a.m. to go to treatment every single morning is a must because it's going to lead to all these different habits that you need to have to be able to sustain yourself for a full season. Yeah. Like if people don't understand that in your situation, your habitat, that's going to affect your habits. That's right. going to affect who you are. That's going to affect your mindset. That's going to affect how you think. That's going to affect how you breathe, how you sleep, how you communicate. And then at the end of the day, it's going to affect how you perform. Yeah. And when you have different results-based businesses like a quota, um, right. on Q1, Q4, whatever that is. If you got film that you gotta, you gotta watch and sit down and, and analyze, if you can't pull yourself out of that frame, if you can't objectively or subjectively, I don't know which one it is, objectively, objectively I think. Yeah. Objectively look right. at that yeah. and be able to, to have perspective, to be able to look at that and say, that's good, that's bad. 
but still have this never ending self improvement to it. Mm. Ch relentlessly chasing perfection, knowing it's never going to be attainable. <clears throat> right. If you can't, if you can't click on all of those different cylinders, man, you're gonna you're gonna be playing victim. Yeah. And I think that's a choice, but I think that's so much that's transferable to whatever anyone's dealing with. Mm -hmm. Like you got to put food on the table. How how can you not say that working that that third shift isn't high stakes as yeah. high stakes as anything else? Right. Because people are counting on you, your family's counting, your kids are counting on you. Um, Rent's counting on it, like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to be able to objectively look at things with a, a constant, never-ending self-improvement lens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, man, let me put my, let, let me check my pride at the door, dog. Like, let me, yeah. let me keep this outside, yeah. and let me walk into this and just try and get better. Let's be curious. Mm -hmm. let, let's see how great B Scar TV can be. Like, yeah. why not? Yeah. Like, let, let's find a different avenue to to adjust and toy with and play with it and figure out what, how we can help people and whatever that ties into your purpose or your mission, like that's, that's everything. So I want to kind of pivot the conversation a little bit, um, just on that note, to off the field and some of the things that, that you're doing. Um, I know that you have your, your foundation mm -hmm. um, and you know, you really focused on, on impact. Can you share a little bit about what your foundation does and <clears throat> how you have maybe taken some of that mindset of growth and, and, um, and attributed that to, you know, impact and growing your foundation and how you touch people's lives. Yeah, I think it's, it's a new challenge, right? It's an infancy stage of a foundation, just started it at the beginning of the year, mm. but you have to, you have to transfer all of these character traits we're talking about from the league yeah. and all the lessons you can learn from teammates. You, you have to be a sponge. You have to listen, you have to look and you have to learn. And you kind of see that, man, not everyone is built like that mentally to be able to sustain a full season, to be mm -hmm. able to sustain the careers that people have built and to be able to put that into a vehicle that can inspire people, that can help people, that can, um, you can relate to at a real level. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's adoption. <clears throat> I think that's what our foundation really is all about. And yeah. it's the Ingle Family Foundation for a reason because it's family. Uh, I found my forever family uh, at birth. Crazy grateful for that and um, just have the best parents in the world. But I never really looked at my life or my adoption story as an issue because of mm -hmm. it, right? Like, right. I know I didn't look like my parents. I know I didn't look like my extended family, but every day I walk, like, that's my sister, that's my cousin, that's my aunt, that's my uncle, that's my, my parents. You know, I never saw anything differently. And to be able to now have a platform, to be in the league, to be able to understand what it takes to build something and sustain it and then transfer it into having a conversation with a kid over Xbox who's also in foster care, mm. um, who had to pack up his garbage bag full of belongings because he's not going to stay at the same place for more than a week or two. Wow. To be able to give kids some school books because they don't know um, where they're going to get it next. Um, to be able to hand out meals, to be able to do Christmases with them and just break bread, have a relatable conversation, to, to break down the walls of NFL player or athlete or whatever that is and relate to them on a real level of being adopted. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's massive and that's what life's all about for me is mm -hmm. being able to have those conversations, to be able to impact somebody so that one day they can go out and they can go chase their own grace, greatness, whether it's be a doctor, a, a pilot, a astronaut, whatever they want to do, it, yeah. a football player. But just to have the courage to go out and do it because you can have so many deep-rooted issues, everyone has them. And adoption is one of them, with um, just being a little bit insecure, yeah. understanding why that situation arose, mm. um, wondering if you're not good enough, fear of failure, fear of self-imagery. Uh, all of those things pop up as kids go through foster care, as people look up in the face and say, I can't take care of you anymore. Mm. And to be able to relate to some of those kids and say like, I have trouble looking in the mirror because I don't, I had, I had a visual issue with my world around me. And at some point I had to overcome that fear of not being good enough and to be able to, for them to know mm. that that's real. That's where you're changing lives. That's where you're able to have a conversation like this and it means something and to actually have an actionable step of change. And that's what our foundation does. And like you said, like I, I never really thought my life was anything like, my adoption story would have been anything anyone could 
relate to or I never really saw it as adversity because my parents were so supportive. I had that system. I had the, the system worked for me and my family, right? Like, mm -hmm. so to be able to then relate to the deep rooted issues of that, to be able to connect to kids that are going through a situation like and help them through it, um, through moments of inspiration, moments of motivation, of moments yeah. of, of just being a kid, being able to let go of all the stress. Like that's, that's empowering. <laughs> I, I swear I learn more from those kids than they learn from me, mm. but um, to be able to have those events now um, and do something behind a vehicle like that is, um, it, it's really, really cool. Yeah, that's amazing, bro. And congratulations on, on starting the foundation. And then it's interesting because what we talked about earlier <clears throat> with the, how the Green Bay Packers, you know, you talked about how you don't remember those conversations necessarily, but you remember how they made you feel, mm. right? And just that interaction. Yeah. And now, you know, years later, you're able to, you know, kind of give kids the same type of positive reinforcement and feelings um, by these conversations. Um, and, you know, I don't know much about <clears throat> the, the system of adoption, but I'm curious, like, uh, the system worked for you, like mm -hmm. you found a loving family at, uh, at birth, but I'm assuming that the system can be a challenge for oh, yeah. many kids. And what is what are some of those challenges uh, within the system of foster care or adoption? Yeah, right now it's uh, adopting teens. So think about you know if you're if you can't have kids, if you can't um, go through that process, and you're thinking about adoption. Nine times out of ten, you're going to think about adopting a baby, mm -hmm. and you don't think about the 13, 14 year old kid because oh, it might be you know they they've already lived their life, they've already grown up, and mm -hmm. it's like you kind of have to take a step back a little bit and be like how many firsts are you going to go through with that kid? How many times are you going to be able to sit down at a dinner table and take them to their driving test and, and help, help them afford to, to drive a car? How many times are you going to you know, go through their graduation, get this kid into college, to be able to have a support system of, of having a first girlfriend or getting engaged, having like marriage. There's so many, having a kid, becoming a grandparent. Like, there's so many firsts that you can have with a teenager that's in foster care right now that uh, people don't think about. They think about um, adopting at, at birth. So, um, and then it's a two-way street too, because then a foster care kid has been in, in the system for 13, 14 mm -hmm. years and right. has been going through it and has been in eight different houses and carries their things in garbage bags because it's easier to move to the next house. Like, how do you honestly tell that kid that we're going to ride or die for the rest of your life and them not right. to have any reservations because right, right. they've heard that they've seen that and they've been lied to like that. And, um, so on both spectrums, you kind of try and educate yeah. people to let them know that you can adopt a teen. Like that's a possibility. There's a lot of kids in the foster care system right now looking for, for homes. Um, but then also hitting the kids and being like, you, this is going to be your family for life. Like if you age out at 18 and um, you can get some support and subsidization from, uh, for housing until you're 24, until you graduate college, like, that's cool, but at the end of the day, who are you going to share those moments with? Mm. Like, right. that vulnerability and that openness, like, that's life, that's family, that's support, that's, that's community. And it's not going to be there forever if you don't accept it, right? It's a, support's a two-way street. So um, just being able to try and communicate that issue on both ends is... Yeah. Um, is something that uh, can be really eye-opening. Yeah, and, and I mean, powerful for you to be a voice for uh, for those on, on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to have <clears throat> the platform uh, that we have with the NFL and football, I think that's, you know, in my experience, one of the most beautiful things about, like, this sport, you know, like running out and playing in front of 70,000 people under the lights is an amazing feeling but then also to remember for me like remember the professional athlete that i got to meet like the portland trailblazer mm. that you know i got his autograph whether you know damon stoudemire or bonzi wells and like how those dudes made me feel you know what i mean yeah. and then it's like okay now being at that stage and being able to <clears throat> have that same platform you know how can i help to inspire you know, a kid or, you know, somebody, a, a kid that maybe is going through a difficult time, right? I think that is one thing that 
you know, the sport of football has given, you know, the both of us that I yeah. think is super powerful, bro. It gives how you full you circle that. moments. Yeah. Like how we wield that, you know, power is like, uh, it means a lot. It's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of accountability. Um, and it can weigh you down, right? Like it can weigh down your shoulders and you can feel like, man, I'm just trying to give, trying to give, trying mm -hmm. to give. And it's like, it can be tough, but if you don't find that purpose in it, if you don't find <clears throat> that deep rooted connection yeah. of like seeing that spark in a kid's eyes when they get it. Yeah. Like those moments, they, they fulfill you. Like that's, mm -hmm. that, that's bigger than any bank account. That's bigger than any dollar amount. That's right. bigger than everything because it's that full circle moment. Like you're talking about like yeah. being that kid. It's rewarding, and, you know, and I think like <clears throat> building a, a foundation and like a 501c3 and having the legitimacy behind right. that intention right now, like gives that impact room to scale and room mm. to grow. Um, you know, I remember my process when I <clears throat> started the Big Yard Foundation back in 2018 and meeting with lawyers and trying to figure out, you know, the bank account for the donations and the letters to send to donors yeah. and all these, you know, processes that we go through. But you know, the mission and the intention that <clears throat> I have and still have today behind the foundation now is like, you know, when people want to donate, obviously they're incentivized to donate with, you know, the structure that's in place, but now it allows this mission to continue to grow, you know, beyond me. It's it gives now, sustainability, it's than me, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, sustainability, you know, and I think the place that, uh, where you're coming from and having the experience that you have and the intention that you have, I think that uh, you know, the the Ingold Family Foundation will it'll, it'll grow beautifully, man. Yeah, it's it's all about yeah that purpose that that mission behind it, right? And so many people have so many different motivations, but as long as the, as the beginning one was pure, right? And it's it's all you can ever ask for. Right. Like it's it's really cool to see that manifest into um, the real world. Like yeah. you're, cre you're creating something in the real world, which mm -hmm. is cool to be able to inspire and impact other people. Yeah. I want to get into a little bit of, <clears throat> uh, some of your studies mm. in college. And now you're, you spoke, you spoke a little bit about financial literacy. You just yep. briefly mentioned that earlier in yep. the conversation. You studied finance in, in college. Yep. Where's your, where's your mindset when you're thinking about <laughs> Where's the money mindset? Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's your money mindset right now, man? <laughs> hey, I, I don't have a, a very high risk tolerance, like yeah. personally. So, uh -huh. um, but just understanding the, like the basic concept of being able to, um, you know, I'm, I'm not asking for someone to feed me. I, I'm trying to go fish, right? Like not asking somebody that whole saying, right? Like, you know, you can teach somebody how to fish or you can just give them, give them fish. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I totally fucked that up. <laughs> give but, a guy a fish, he eat for a night. Yeah. Teach a man to fish. He'll eat for a lifetime. Eat for a lifetime. So that's, that's really what it was for me, breaking it yeah. down and um, going to college, taking that leap of let's not get a communication degree. Let's, let's maybe um, do something where I'm going to understand how this game is played because it's a different game than, than anything else. Like mm -hmm. money works, um, tax law, Boy. the way that things can flow. Um, if you don't take ownership and understand it for yourself, that's, that's a dangerous game you're playing. And just seeing, you know, my education was financial literacy was like straight up retirement savings plans. Like, what's the retirement gap? How are we going to get you there from, you know, when you stop working at 55 till the day you die? Yeah. And to be able to extrapolate those information, make it functional, make it useful for anybody. Um, it is really cool to, to see the principles of money, how it flows, how it works. Um, but then also to turn around and tell the next person, like, yeah. hey, dog, like, you might really want to take some time and learn this for yourself. You might want to, you know, go on um, Chegg or you might want to go on um, YouTube and <laughs> instead of watching, you know, college football pump up videos, like maybe let's, <laughs> let's watch right. a little bit of um, whoever we want influencing us on money decisions. Mm. And it's cool to see an, a number of guys start to take that step in yeah. ownership in the locker room specifically. Um, I know yourself, B. Cope is another guy that I look oh, up to. Is yeah, just Cope's different. a monster. Just moves different. <laughs> yeah. and, um, just, sure. But just to see that, right? And to see the moves that they make, it's, it's consistent. It's the discipline. It's the same character traits we've been talking about. But you transfer that into a vehicle that can give you financial freedom in your family. Yeah. Uh, a freedom of, of choice and, and 
everything. Yeah. So you said Beat Cope. Who's another influential voice for you in just the financial realm, whether athlete or not? I think I think B Cope is the main guy for me that I kind of look to yeah. um, from a distance to hear Whitehead was in the locker room with us uh, mm-hmm. real quick yeah. uh, over in Oakland, um, where you kind of watch from afar yeah. and you kind of understand the different intricacies of friggin' creating a Discord account, like be yeah. able to connect to people that way and yeah. the communication, the flow of money. So uh, I definitely have tied into my wealth advisors uh, in their network. Um, through Northwestern Mutual just to be able to uh, see the different businesses, like see yeah. how people work, see how um, you can communicate with money, to, to be able to build a foundation but then build an LLC on top of it, to mm. be able to um, take steps in the real estate game, to be yeah. able to see ex-NFL guys. Uh, I know Justin Forsett has um, mm-hmm. his uh, the shower, yeah, pill shower pill that he developed yeah. and you know deals with Target, Walmart, all that. Being an entrepreneur, to uh, there's a guy Kofi uh, out in LA. He's selling celebrity, you know, real estate mm. to be able to see his development from, you know, just selling you know Michael Jordan's estate to now he's building um, expansive projects in, in like na- like outside of the nation, like internationally, yeah. like. To see guys in the league be able to take those steps, whether it's real estate, venture capitalist. Um, I know Ryan Neese is another guy that Ryan I kind of lean on yeah. um, that is doing his thing. So there's guys in different areas where, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's real estate, whether it's um, you know, VC, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see. Um, Keith Smith, another guy, fullback, mm, right? Like yeah, doing beef. his thing in Web3, <laughs> beef, yeah. Like, but then it's, it's real estate. And to see um, one of the biggest principles, I think, um, I've seen or influenced on is like the main thing is the main thing, right? And for us, that's football. And that's, that's the avenue of financially your growth. That's, that's where uh, everything's getting funded. But then, you know, you're able to take that and you're able to experiment in other different places and learn yeah. from other people to then transform into sustainable um, levels of income that are passive, that yeah. are uh, active if you want to, if you find passion in that. So that, that's kind of my thing, right? Like if we got this lane going right now, we're going to focus on this lane and, and we're going to make the most out of it. But let's see what other guys are doing. Let, let's get curious. Let's ask questions. Let's see how the games work in other different areas where you might be able to leverage some of these relationships, some of these um, other people's experiences, Yeah. successes and failures. No doubt. No doubt. And to have a network of guys like that you just that roster of dudes that you just listed off you know all stars and guys that have been willing to share their knowledge you know they're they're soaking up tons of information mm-hmm. and making a lot of moves but then they're also sharing which i think for you know guys current players former future players just to be able to like lend an ear even if it's just a short instagram reel of cope talking about why cash flow is important you know what i mean like yeah. Just how far that can go, right? Because now I'm thinking about it a little bit like, damn, yeah, he's right. Like cash flow is important. <laughs> yeah, it you gets know? your mind working, but it yeah. keeps your mind there too. It mm-hmm. keeps your mind there on, on different places like that. And it's cool to see guys, uh, you know, it's not a competition like where it's cutthroat. It's, there's, there's game for everybody. Yeah. And um, to see people kind of wear that cap the right way is, um, like you're saying, that's how you get influence, that's how you build relationships, and that's how business works. Have you made some big investments? No, I mean, I, I really haven't. I think I have just two properties now. Um, okay. That, you know, that I'm <laughs> working on. Those are big investments, bro. What do you <laughs> but, mean? Hey, but I think it's 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 more the process. I think yeah. that I'm I'm obsessed with. I'm obsessed with the process. I'm yeah. obsessed with um, learning. And like I said, my risk tolerance is pretty low, so I, I'm penny pinching when it comes to investing in in crypto, in Web three, in yeah. NFTs, to be able to see. Um, I feel like I, I just really want to listen. I want to learn. I want yeah. to really understand the full concept of what you're getting into before you get into it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's just the biggest thing for me. Yeah. Um, what about you? What do you shit? I've, I've got uh, a lot. I have a few properties in Portland, back in Portland. Um, I've gotten into some VC funds, um, but those are all you know long term. Like yeah. I'm thinking real long term, right? And um, building equity through real estate, 
through private investments, whether it's private equity and VC, but then now thinking also about, because all that being like passive mm -hmm. income, right? And now thinking about how do I, you know, leverage some of my interests and hobbies, right? And, yeah. you know, spent a lot of time over the past year working on a creative agency called Scarlet Creative uh, that I hope to, you know, grow into the, uh, the biggest agency, not just uh, in sports, but beyond and, you know, really leaning into telling stories of, uh, of athletes and brands, um, you know, that want their stories told in a genuine way and being able to uh, create high quality productions that stand out from the crowd and are telling genuine stories um, and want to scale that as a yeah. business, you know, and, and this B Scar TV kind of being the, the proof of concept mm. uh, for that in a way for me to really just get off some of my own creative uh, endeavors or aspirations, yeah. you know, and just being not only an outlet, but for creativity, but like, you know, trying to structure it in a way that's sustainable. It's so cool when you talk about investing, right? Because it's like you bring up the financial stuff, the passive stuff. You talk about investing your time. You talk about investing your energy. You talk about investing your resources beyond just finances, like mentally, yeah. spiritually, physically. Mm -hmm. um, to see you doing it and diversifying it, right? Like that's, yeah. that's a principle of money. That's a principle of finance. But you're able to do that in life. You're right. able to transfer that to, to be able to be that proof proof of concept, to learn hands-on, to be able to go through it so yeah. that when you're talking about scalability, you can have conversations with the, the C-suite people 10 years down the road and be like, I've been there, I've done that. Look at this, look at this proof of concept, like, look at this work that we went through. Right. And that just helps you so much, I feel like, understand the ins and outs of what you're going through on a daily basis yeah. to then grow, scale, sustain. So the principles that you eventually instill in other people, it comes with there's proof in the pudding. Yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. We got some B-Scar TV questions for you. Man. B -Scar TV questions. What is a TV show or movie that you're just a little bit embarrassed to admit that you love? I'm watching Ted Lasso right now, but I have no embarrassment about loving that show. Okay. Uh, so that's not a good answer for this question. Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. Um, trying to think of something embarrassing. So for me, when I was in high school, me and my, my homeboy, we used to always watch The Hills. Mm. You remember The Hills? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was just kind of like a little guilty pleasure. Though. Yeah, <laughs> I've been watching uh, Snowflake Mountain on Netflix. Snowflake Mountain? Yeah. What's that about? It's like a reality TV show type of deal. Okay. Um, yeah. Game, Any show. <laughs> yeah. game show, reality okay. TV type of thing. It's like Survivor, but not at all. It's yeah. a Netflix version. It's um. So I think that'd be my But not answer. like Temptation Island. Like it's not that deep on the No, no, team. it's just somewhere in the middle. Of yeah. <laughs> it's it's not all the way out there. Yeah. Who is the best person or profile uh, to follow on Instagram? Who's your favorite follow? I really do I like Inky Johnson. Inky Johnson? Yeah. I like Will Compton. Will Compton's good. Two two separate instances. <laughs> yeah. But Will's got that dog in him now yeah. when he talk when he talks mindset, but um yeah, both those guys. If you could trade places with any of your teammates for a day, who would it be and why? <laughs> I feel like I would want to trade places with a guy like Raekwon. Yeah. Because I just want to know what it's like to be that big. Yeah. And he's a big dude. He's, I mean, he's doing his thing. It takes up a lot, of, a lot of space. No pause. <laughs> pause. <laughs> big pause. Which teammate would you want to swap closets with? Mmm. I feel like this is a this is a pandering question to the guy I'm sitting with right now. Like it's a leading question now. The dude's got a lot of vintage, a lot of a lot of diversity. He's got a deep bag. Hey man, I'm I'm honored that you want to swap. <laughs> I felt like that's with me, man. Let's just pump up this guy's tires real quick. You have a Mike Tyson vintage shirt on. Yeah. Is that a Culture Kings? This classic? is a Culture King special. Um, yeah, big fan of Culture Kings, but. The thing I like about your closet the most is I can tell it take effort. Like it's the subtleties, right? It's the mm. subtle pieces where you don't just, you know, do a little quick search on Google and find that. Like you go into stores, 
you might shoot your shot 30 times. You might find one, you know what I'm saying? Like you spent some time on this. Thing. So that's where I think the subtleties kind of, um, yeah, that's fair. That's where it, show, it shows that's its fair. races there. That's fair. And you know, I, 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 I work hard to make it seem like I don't work that hard. Exactly. You know what I mean? That's what like, I'm I want saying. it to it's come off like it's, it's intentional like it's that easy. Way. Yeah. But yeah, I spend a lot of time sifting. It's, it's intentional. <laughs> Which actor would you cast to play your part in the TV version of your life? Does it have to be a TV actor though? It could be whoever. Could be. Whoever you want to like tell your story. I see. I feel like there's a lot of tough answers here because it's like, you know, I'm a big movie guy now. Okay. And I feel like you go someone too much like action adventure, you know what I'm saying? And like, there's not yeah. a whole lot of people to be able to, I, mean, I feel you, like it would you're be a, a hero story. So I feel like, it, it no, there. but I think the, the encapsulation of the story would be someone that you probably never met before. Someone that looks like they're just down the street. Someone that's been okay. overseen throughout all like the acting school, whatever. Oh, okay. You know what I I'm see. saying? Yeah, it's no yeah. Disney TV star, no. Like almost like how Euphoria did it. Like when got, got the old buddy off the street. Exactly. Okay. I feel like that's... that's so what, so what street? Are we going back to Green Bay? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, we're going back I, to hey, Green we're Bay. Going, we're going back to Green Bay and we're going back at the adoption agency. We're going to find a kid. <laughs> you know I like, like that. It's going to be as genuine as possible. And you might not might be for everybody, but it's going to be real. Wow. We're, uh, we're coming up on time here. Mm. I appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, you know, being able to just spend some time with you and really get to learn more about who you are and learn your story and where you've come from, adversity you battled through. It's, uh, it's cool, man. I'm Appreciate the time, to, man. looking uh, forward to this season, brother. Another op. Another Let's op. Let's do it. Let's do it. And there you have it, folks. Another episode of B-Scar TV. My man, Alec Ingold, a.k.a. Hitman, <laughs> a.k.a. number 30 now. Let's go. Where can uh, the people find you if the people want to find you? Uh, AlecIngold.com is probably the easiest way. Uh, obviously, any socials. Just, nice. You know, you just hit that search bar and just type in the name. Be... And if somebody wants to donate to the foundation? Alec yeah, AlecIngold.com. There will be backslash foundation. Um, you know, you can see anything. We talked about mindset, character traits. Um, if you're trying to be, you know, an aspiring young athlete, I think that's a good spot for you to go. Mm. Foundation-wise, if you're looking to support an adoption, there's a page for that. Um, if you're just trying to follow along, there's another page for that. So, Dope. yeah, it's all there. I'm going to check it out, man. It's high quality content, baby.